On behalf of the Fairbanks Center, I want to uh, welcome everyone to our weekly Critical Issues Confronting China. And we have the best possible speaker for today, uh, Jeff Bader, uh, who worked very closely in the Obama administration uh, and worked very closely with Biden. Uh, I wish we had more definitive results to report to you, uh, but Jeff, who watches these things very carefully, uh, thinks the trend is looking good for Biden. And so uh, he may be on uh, our, our uh, next president. And uh, since Jeff uh, works so closely with him, uh, he understands uh, what it's like uh, to work for that person and also what it's like in a new administration getting started, how you deal with uh, China. Uh, Jeff uh, is a graduate of Yale, and then he got his PhD in European history uh, before he joined the Foreign Service. He spent many years in the Foreign Service. Uh, he was ambassador to Namibia, uh, and uh, he uh, served uh, at the White House uh, for two years as Obama's uh, right-hand man on uh, China. And uh, he wrote an excellent book on that period called Obama and China's Rise, uh, which is a very detailed, uh, thoughtful analysis of what was going on then. So we're very, very lucky to have uh, uh, Jeff with us. And uh, I won't take any more of his time. Jeff, it's yours. I'll, I'll jump in real quick, Ezra, if you don't mind, and just sure. tell everybody how to ask questions at the end, because I'm sure we'll have lots. Um, it, those of you who have done this before will know, um, but there is a tab at the bottom. There's a Q&A button in that tab. If you click on that, you can enter your name um, and your affiliation. If you want to ask a question, um, if you want to ask anonymously, make sure you have the anonymous option checked. And thank you all. Um, I'll turn it over to Jeff. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ezra. Great to see you again. Uh, you and I were together in Washington during the Clinton administration. Yes. Um, remember it well. Uh, and benefited from your wisdom then and since. <clears throat> uh, I will say that last night kind of drove a truck through what I was uh, planning to say today and I kind of cobbled it back together again as I've watched the morning uh, results uh, oscillating here and there. There's a bit of a feeling of deja vu all over again for me. I, four years ago during the campaign in 2016, I remember I was giving a presentation, I was asked about what the possible impact of a, of a Trump election on US relations with China might be. I was asked this sometime in the summer. And I answered that, uh, let's hypothesize that an asteroid is heading towards Earth is gonna crash soon. Um, I think that the impact on US relations with China would be kind of a footnote. Hmm? Um, I was kind of half right and half wrong on that. I'm afraid the asteroid had the predictable impact, but uh, China turned out to be more of a footnote. Um, and while I'm going down memory lane, I just remember in the year 2000, uh, when I was an ambassador overseas, uh, I was walking into a, a TV studio to talk about the US election at seven in the morning. And as I was walking in, I asked my political counsel what was going on, and he said that it was essentially a tie, and that George Bush was leading by 500 votes in in Florida. So I went on 15 seconds later, and I had to say something. Um, when you're an ambassador, you learn in those situations what you do is you just mumble, and you get through it okay. Uh, so this time I'll try to do something better than mumble, because I'm not an ambassador anymore. So I guess I have to speak candidly. So I'm going to talk about the challenges that I think China now poses and what kind of policies the U.S. might uh, might pursue that might, would make sense and would not make sense. Uh, and also talk about what uh, the administration after January 20 might do vis-a-vis -vis China. I'd like to do that mainly in the Q's and A's and talk in the presentation mainly about the general framework for policy. I think Americans generally and the bipartisan foreign policy elite see China as the most important relationship for the United States in the 21st century. Uh, it offers challenges across the entire spectrum uh, of uh, relations with the US as its dramatic rise proceeds. 
Uh, the consensus with which I agree is that China is and will be a strategic competitor. That's gonna be the main framework going forward. The turn away from broad cooperation with China we've seen in recent years has been owing to several factors. I think number one, it's growing power. Number two, the uh, slowing down, if not freeze in market-driven reforms. Uh, number three, the renewed stress on ideology and uh, repression in Xinjiang and Hong Kong in particular. And finally, threats to uh, neighbors, including the South China Sea, uh, India, uh, and increasing hints of coercion toward Taiwan. But the scope of the challenge, I think, is larger than just those developments. Uh, China is soon to be the largest economy in the world and the largest market in the world. Uh, it's going to vie with the US for the lead in technology innovation and utilization. Uh, it is developing a military that can challenge the US in the Western Pacific, including threatening Taiwan. Uh, it has a governance model that is based on efficiency control and surveillance that is uniting with other authoritarian regimes, not only on human rights, but in trying to set standards in the digital age. It's the world's biggest emitter of greenhouse gases and is playing a growing role in multilateral rules making uh, and finance providing as the US has retreated. Uh, just a few words on the approach of the Trump administration. Uh, that has been to identify the Chinese Communist Party as the existential enemy of the United States abroad than at home. It's mainly been articulated by Secretary of State Pompeo and echo echoed by others. Uh, US government officials who came before are described as naive and having facilitated the rise of this uh, emerging threat. The administration has declared the end of engagement. Um, it has initiated uh, a large scale decoupling in most domains and the flood of sanctions in the last eight months. Uh, research and student exchanges, NGO activity, flow of investment capital, operation of consulates, and of course, technology and trade all have been targeted uh, in some cases they have been reciprocal actions to respond to Chinese restrictions. In other cases, they've been preemptive. Uh, US-China relations long seen as mutually beneficial are now seen by this administration as primarily having the effect of strengthening our 21st century enemy. Uh, I'll offer a perspective that differs from this. Uh, first, what's the nature of the challenge that China is presenting? And what does China want? I think primarily it's pretty straightforward. Um, since the reformers of the Qing dynasty in the 19th century, they want a strong and prosperous China. Uh, and a strong and China's, uh, prosperous China, uh, in the view of the Chinese leadership, requires stability, which in their view requires the unquestioned leadership of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, the main elements uh, that will sustain uh, stability and achieve uh, a strong and prosperous China, in their view, are continued strong economic growth, national unity, or reunification, and protection of sovereignty. Uh, these objectives are leading to a few developments. Number one, a military that's seeking parity with the U.S. and the Western Pacific. Uh, number two, a Belt and Road Initiative that's building infrastructure and relationships uh, throughout Central and Southeast Asia uh, and into Europe and elsewhere. Uh, number three, becoming a leader in high technology. Uh, number four, assuming a leadership role in international institutions. I think some of these goals are achievable, uh, some less so. Some are related to peculiarities of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, but mostly I'd consider them to be major, normal major power behavior or expected nationalist Chinese behavior. Um, there are limits 
to the Chinese challenge. Let's just touch, touch on those briefly. I think the military, while it's achieving, seeking to achieve uh, parity in the Western Pacific is not going to be a global peer competitor or a threat to the US homeland, except in some unthinkable nuclear war scenario uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, personally, I don't take seriously the threat of United Front subversion in the United States that we read uh, much about. Happy to talk further about that in Q&A if people wish, uh, but I am not uh, someone who uh, lives in fear of the United Front. Um, the Chinese domestic economy still has major needs and challenges. Uh, even though it's gonna be the largest economy in the world soon, it only ranks about number 65 in the world in per capita per capita income. Its demographics are challenging. Right now, there's about seven point, about seven workers for each one uh, retired, uh, retired citizen. By 2015, that ratio was gonna be more like one and a half to one. Uh, number three, they're gonna have to catch up on social issues which have been neglected in the pursuit of breakneck economic growth, namely environment. Uh, where they are making strides, but they've had the worst environment in the world, along with India for quite some time. Uh, public health, where we have certainly seen uh, the shortcomings in recent months, and food safety. Um, China's soft power uh, is unattractive abroad. Uh, the places where you might expect it to be attractive would be other ethnic Chinese uh, uh, countries or areas, Taiwan and Singapore are singularly unattracted uh, to the Chinese uh, Chinese model. So I don't expect it to be attractive beyond that. Um, China is not going to array a network of satellite states against us the way the Soviet Union did. Uh, and last when this one is, uh, I think arguable, but I, I would have said that with greater confidence a few years ago that the rigidity of the political system of China is going to be a problem going forward that they're going to have to overcome. Now, given its generally impressive performance in recent years and questions and the performance of the Western democracies, uh, I don't feel as categorical about that as I would have a few years ago, but I still, I guess, would assert that that remains a challenge for China. So what does this all mean for U.S. policy and what do I hope uh, a post-January 20th administration will do in order to compete with China. And first, uh, the U.S. has to get its own house in order. You can win the race with China by running faster, not by tripping the other guy. Uh, if we seek or advertise a goal to prevent China's rise, that's a formula for intense rivalry, for resentment from ordinary Chinese, for lack of support elsewhere in the world, uh, and contrary to our traditions, frankly, and it simply won't work. We have to secure the defense of our allies, particularly uh, in the region. Uh, we have to show that we can compete economically, especially in Asia, where the US government has been absent. We have to maintain our values. We can't surrender openness and win a race with China to the bottom through prohibitions, through expansive definitions of national security and evaluating investments, through managed trade, through canceling exchanges, through visa bans, through diplomatic restrictions, and McCarthyite smears of scholars and researchers. When we take punitive steps, which we will from time to time, the goal has to be to seek to make reciprocity work toward greater openness by Beijing, not encourage their instincts to the contrary. Uh, our allies and other partners share many of our concerns. They share our economic grievances, many of our security concerns, fears of Chinese bullying, opposition to authoritarian practices, 
we need to work with them, not just give them lip service. That means on trade investment policies, on infrastructure construction, on export controls, on digital issues, uh, and internet, internet rules, and military cooperation, genuinely working with allies. Uh, and the last area I'd mentioned in the competition area is technology, which I think is going to be the heart of the rivalry. Uh, AI is going to provide the basis for leadership in the 21st century uh, in military innovation, in bioengineering, in energy, in telecom, uh, in a vast range of areas critical to the US economy and national security. Uh, I don't purport to be a technology expert. Uh, I listen to the experts. The general framework that the ones whom I respect talk about is high walls and small yards for what we're going to protect. Uh, a few words on the limits of competition. I think, first of all, cooperation with China remains hugely in US interest on transnational issues, where there's still great economic synergy between our two countries. On climate change, uh, international cooperation is impossible without working with China. Uh, COVID-19 and SARS were both of Chinese origin. We're not going to solve these or the next pandemic without working with China. Uh, Iran and North Korea nuclear weapons programs, we're going to need Chinese help on them. Uh, I think on each of these, a Biden administration is a more likely uh, partner with the Chinese than Trump, since Trump has basically turned his back on, uh, on all of these. Um, but these are US interests. I think while our allies have similar concerns to us about the Chinese, that doesn't mean they're gonna join us in massive decoupling. And having the US as a security partner doesn't mean that they're gonna be willing to sign up for a Cold War. They have their own interests, mainly economic with China, and they don't see China in black and white or zero sum terms. A radical decoupling, which is on the agenda of some, would lead to number one, crippling world efforts to cooperate in tackling the global challenges I just talked about. Number two, would eliminate the real synergies between our economies. Number three, would fracture supply chains and markets and force companies to either compete in one or the other market or have separate product lines. Uh, number four would exacerbate the arms race and crowd out US domestic priorities. Uh, number five would arouse ethnic hatreds and stereotypes. And most importantly, would increase the risk of war. The theme of China as an enemy gets oxygen from its human rights record of late, which rightfully will impede China's international rise and influence. China's changes and impacts on the world, however, go well beyond these undeniable black marks. We can't ignore them, but we can't have a single-minded focus on them. It won't achieve results, no one else will join us. Uh, and in my experience, the US can best be persuasive to Chinese and others by cleaning up, so, cleaning up its own act and serving as an example and inspiration. So in closing, I just say a constructive functional US-China relationship not only can serve US interests but provide incentives and restraints for Chinese decision makers. There are still reformers, and I know some of them, who need support and encouragement. And the relationship with the US provides that. On the other hand, if Beijing sees nothing to lose vis-a-vis -vis the relationship with the US as an enemy, 
that will encourage dangerous risk taking by the leadership in Beijing. But modern China has had lots of ups and downs since Mao. We shouldn't assume the China of 10 years from now will be the same one we face now. We need to try to match the Chinese in taking a longer term view of the relationship and what we seek uh, and not respond excessively to every headline and every twist and turn. Uh, thank you very much for listening to me and I'm looking forward to your comments and your questions and answers. Ezra, you're muted. Okay. Um, my, am I okay now? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Well, I, I think we owe uh, Jeff a vote of thanks for the very comprehensive, thoughtful, uh, overall view of what we should be doing. Uh, and I assume that uh, some way, some of that message will be going to the people who will be advising. Uh, so if we had a Biden a presidency, um, what do you think the, 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 uh, if the Biden becomes president, uh, what would be his instincts as to how to go about working with China? Uh, would he make a trip early? Would he uh, develop a close relationship with Xi Jinping? Uh, would he be more cautious uh, because of the current mood in Washington? Uh, how, how do you think he would uh, approach the China question if he were to become president? Uh, those are all um, great and somewhat unanswerable questions, but um, that won't stop me. Um, I think, of, first of all, Ezra, as I look at uh, a Biden agenda, uh, I've told Chinese counterparts that if I were them, I would not expect uh, early concentration by the administration on China uh, or a Biden trip, or for that matter, concentration on foreign policy. Um, and the reason is that Biden's agenda uh, is going to be overwhelmingly uh, domestic, uh, enormous challenges, and we know what they are, um, beginning, uh, beginning with COVID which has been his main campaign issue and which he has to deal with uh, at one minute after 12 on January 20th, um, the associated economic uh, challenges that we face, which are going to require uh, attention, stimulus package, some restructuring. Um, at some point before too long, a comprehensive immigration package, uh, a uh, ref revival renaissance of the U.S. government slash civil service, uh, trying to do something about the extreme polarization of the U.S. governance uh, system, um, dealing with racial tensions and social justice issues. There's just a massive domestic portfolio that they have to concentrate on. And as you, you know, a president tends to have his accomplishments in the first six months or a year or not at all. Uh, and he can't let those, uh, th that time slip away, okay? So I think that we, that has to condition everything. Now, in terms of foreign policy, my instinct is that the first objective of the Biden team is going to be to restore the US image abroad and to restore U.S. alliances uh, and participation uh, in multilateral institutions, international institutions, um, and uh, let's try to shore up the liberal international order that this administration has made uh, its target. Uh, so if I'm uh, President Biden, the first thing I'm doing on foreign policy is getting together with uh, NATO allies, EU countries, 
uh, Japan, Australia, Canada, South Korea, uh, and so on. Uh, and showing that the U.S. is back, that the U.S. cares about them, uh, and the U.S. is going to coordinate with them. Uh, the, they're going to be serious and meaningful consultations. And if you're going to do that and you mean that, you can't announce a China policy uh, on day one and then just go off and uh, consult with these folks. Uh, it's not serious. So it, it just kind of... It's very hard to sequence these things. The world doesn't stop while you're doing doing one thing, but to the extent that they can control it, I would think they would be the try trying to get some coordination among like-minded countries uh, before locking in too much on China. Uh, I would expect if Biden wins sometime in the next week or two, uh, most of the major heads of state in the world will pick up the phone and call them to congratulate them. Uh, these tend to be somewhat, these tend to be uh, protocolary, somewhat perfunctory calls, not substantive. Uh, that said, I have no doubt the media uh, will, will get their hands on the highlights of what is said, even if it's a short call. And given the state of US-China relations and the trajectory it's been on for the last eight months, there will be profound, huge attention on one or two sentences coming out of that. Are they gonna say, you know, steady as she goes, or you know, I'm picking up where Mike Pompeo left off, or um, back to, you know, back to the good old days of uh, the 1980s. You know, it's just, those are the extremes, it's not gonna be that. But there will be some kind of a message in one or two sentences coming out of that. Mm -hmm. um, probably kind of a, a holding action. Mm -hmm. um, the Biden has a lot of experience with China. He visited China, I think. I think he was in maybe the first congressional delegation that went in. Uh, after we normalized relations in January 1st, 1979. I think he was in shortly thereafter. Mm -hmm. So he's been involved with China for, well, for 40 years. So he's got views on China. Uh, I've talked about China. He, uh, uh, he is not someone whose instincts take him towards a, uh, an existential zero-sum relationship with China. That's not his instinct. Uh, on the other hand, I think the entire U.S. political spectrum has moved towards a harder position uh, on China, uh, including uh, including his advisors, his his likely advisors, uh, none of whom I would consider an ideologue, uh, all of whom I consider pragmatic, but all of whom I think will see uh, competition with China and reassurance to allies uh, as high priorities. Um, I don't know if that covers uh, I guess that covers the main points you you address, but that's kind of that's kind of where I see it at the outset. Hmm? I appreciate that. We have lots of questions come in and one of them is from Mike Zoni. Uh, who has been the director of our uh, Fairbanks Center. He was a Ming historian who also uh, worked on uh, uh, Kimoi and uh, Matsu. And uh, he uh, uh, is given a year of leave to go back to his own work this year, uh, but he's attended your session. So Mike, it's yours. Uh, most of these questions will come in written, but I wonder, um, uh, Mark, whether you can fix it so that he can uh, present himself uh, those questions. Trying to pull him in right now. Hi, hi, Jeff. Thanks so much for uh, for 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 a great talk. It's great. It's great to see you. Uh, you can hear me. Yes, yeah. I hear you good. Um, so my question has to do with your comment about uh, technological competition or technology competition being at the heart of the U.S.-China competition going forward. Uh, one hears that argument quite a bit. I'm wondering if you can say something about what form you think that, that competition might take. 
Um, technological competition is different than economic or military competition. A lot of technological innovation is non-zero sum uh, and easily, uh, uh, easily replicable. Uh, what do you think that technological competition between the two countries is, is actually going to look like? Thank you. Oh uh, yeah, Mike. That's a uh, that's a great question and the key question. Um, and uh, uh, I I'm cautious about treading in technology areas when there are people who know much much more. Um, and um, of an age where I didn't grow up with these technologies, but the people whom I trust the most and I learn the most from on these issues, uh, and I'd put kind of a, I think at the top of the queue. Um, uh, Eric Schmidt uh, you know, and <clears throat> others of similar experience. What I, what I hear from them is that they believe that the <clears throat> uh, whoever innovates the key technology platforms uh, in the 20th, 21st century um, not develops apps like TikTok uh, or WeChat, but the platforms, uh, that that country will have uh, a, uh, a preeminence, if not dominant position uh, in, uh, in military uh, capabilities going forward. I think that Schmidt has led a defense uh, study group a uh, study group on defense and technology, and he's looked into this. Uh, and I, I think the same thing would be true uh, in other key uh, economic sectors going forward, like bio, uh, like biomedical, bioengineering, um, telecom. So I don't think that these uh, these app wars that we're in the middle of. Um, TikTok and the Chinese block and Facebook and Google. I don't think that that is the essence of the challenge. Uh, I think it has more to do with platforms. Um, it probably has to do with, uh, with semiconductors, with the uh, highest end semiconductors, which find their way into, I'm gonna find their way into most products uh, going forward uh, in international trade. Um, and the, I, I agree with the, uh, the implication of what you said, that, that the idea of a, a sharp division between the US and China uh, on technology really is not gonna work. Um, so I'm, I'm not quite sure how you have a highly competitive technology relationship uh, and a, um, uh, an overlapping one, but that clearly is what we're going to end up in. Um, if you talk to the key people uh, who've thought about this in the technology space, so it's you know we're going to be in a, in a gray area, not a black and white area. Uh, the political pressures uh, in the Congress are all towards uh, towards self sufficiency uh, and towards. Um, excluding uh, China uh, from technology cooperation. Uh, the people you talk to in Silicon Valley and technology area tends to be more nuanced. Um, I don't know, I mean, if there's someone who really has studied this issue deeply on this line, I'd be delighted to hear, uh, hear from them on it. Um, <clears throat> if somebody does uh, show up, uh... Uh, we'll, we'll put them on. But we have lots of uh, questions. Here's one from an anonymous attendee. It has to do with the global rise of authoritarianism. And while this is new uh, trajectory, it's not clear whether the rise of authoritarianism is a blip or it may be the whole world may be moving in that direction. We already see the United States is losing soft power. China is increasingly putting emphasis on increasing errors. Uh, do you have any projections of how our power dynamics might shift within the new global order and what the role of an authoritarian uh, country like China would be? 
Uh, I guess the, my first answer would be that's somewhat in our hands. It depends how how we as a society perform <clears throat> and how the Europeans perform and how we and the Europeans, um, as Canadians and Australians relate to each other. Uh, the, uh, this would have seemed like an absurd hypothesis five years ago, I guess, <clears throat> the notion that there was a significant authoritarian threat <clears throat> Um, in the United States or in Western Europe or in the other like-minded countries. Uh, I think one can't be quite as confident uh, in dismissing, dismissing that after the last few years, uh, although I will feel better in a few days, I think, um, if the election comes out the way it currently looks. But I don't know that... Um, democracy is uh, that fragile uh, between the United States and Europe um, that we're uh, either on the last legs or we're heading into uh, the 1930s. Um, if that's the case, I mean, the, the developing world has always been kind of wide open uh, in terms of forms of government. Hmm? The, the, the American notion that sort of democracy is on the march uh, throughout the uh, developing world and we we're gradually going to see one domino after another fall uh, until uh, some version of the end of history with an all democratic world uh, has never made sense to me uh, and makes um, uh, no sense at all to me right now. The, the the Biden administration is talking about an alliance of democracies, about putting together a group of democratic countries to coordinate uh, U.S. policies to the extent that we can. And I understand where the impulse is coming from. It comes from sort of deep within our value system and also comes from belief that in the last few years, we have completely neglected our sort of moral core and uh, our democratic values who's uh, in turning our back on other democratic countries. So I think the instinct is sound, but once you get into the real world and try to practice that, what you tend to find is that the US and Europe uh, and Japan and Canada and Australia tend to be somewhat aligned uh, on democracy promotion, human rights promotion, human rights defense uh, issues. And I would expect we will on digital and internet issues as well. But when you get beyond those countries into developing countries, even democratic developing countries like India or Brazil when Brazil is democratic or Mexico or South Africa uh, or even South Korea, um, they have no interest in democracy promotion or signing on to a Western human rights agenda. They just won't. I mean, you look what's going on in the Human Rights Council on Xinjiang, huh? where the Europeans and the Americans voted to condemn uh, China and no one else did. Uh, no one in the developing world and none of the Islamic countries. So I think that developing countries uh, are now and will for the foreseeable future be up for grabs. Uh, in terms of uh, their choice between authoritarian or more democratic uh, models. Uh, one would hope that, look, so in the 1990s, it was a great move towards democracy because the US model had transparently demonstrated its success, uh, its viability, its attractiveness uh, during the Cold War and in its latest stages. Um, if we're moving in a different direction now, it's not because we're not throwing our weight around enough, it's because we are no longer projecting that uh, attractive model. So the degree to which we can once again become a source of uh, global inspiration, um, I think to that degree we can give encouragement to forces resisting authoritarianism uh, in the developing world. Um, another uh, question <clears throat> comes in, as you know, in the universities, we're very concerned about now the big drop-off uh, during coronavirus of Chinese students. 
And we scholars have very little contact with our counterparts. We try to do what we can. Uh, but uh, under a Biden administration, what would you expect to happen uh, to international student and scholarly exchange? And are there things that we can do that would uh, give our universities a bigger opportunity uh, to have more contact? Uh, yeah, Ezra, I think, uh, personally, I think that's a very promising area for a turnaround from where we are now. Um, if you look at the Trump administration policies on China, uh, kind of across the board, uh, you'll find that the tough policies on trade, on technology, uh, on, oh, I don't know, on, uh, on the range of other uh, issues that we alluded to, um, cracking down on IPR, or espionage, whatever. There is a, a fair degree of Washington support uh, for the directions, if not the specific steps that the Trump administration took. However, if you look at uh, policies towards students, towards researchers, uh, I don't see enthusiasm uh, in the Biden team for those policies. I think that they associate them uh, with kind of the worst instincts uh, of the Trump administration, not just the foreign policy team, but uh, people in the White House, the anti-immigrant uh, and xenophobic uh, strands uh, in the administration, which the Biden team does not share. So, you know, for instance, things like the termination of the Fulbright program, you know, the ending of the Peace Corps program, uh, the uh, sharp cutback in the H1B1 visa program, uh, the very tightened scrutiny of uh, researchers, particularly in the STEM areas. Uh, there are a whole bunch of steps that I think that people in a Biden administration uh, will not reflexively inherit, uh, but will re-examine. Uh, now, there, there is always going to be a constituency in the U.S. government for uh, being prudent and careful on STEM, uh, on STEM research and STEM uh, students in the U.S. when there are uh, likely or possible classification connections. Uh, and you know, that's obviously a t difficult thing to measure. But I don't think it would be anywhere near as expansive a definition as the current uh, administration would have. So what's to do? Uh, I would hope that that uh, leaders of the academic uh, community, university presidents, uh, uh, and heads of China programs around the country uh, would be in touch with uh, Biden. Uh, administration officials before January on the assumption that he's going to be president and make clear uh, what your preferences are uh, and be candid about where you see risks and challenges. Uh, you, if you just go in there uh, and say, uh, no problem, open the spigots, people tend to be a little more skeptical, but they, I believe, will be open to our a reasons and rational uh, pitch about how what we're doing now is not only damaging to universities, uh, but very frankly, contrary to our, uh, to our traditions and our values. Uh, we're very fortunate at Harvard now in having uh, one of our own, uh, Mark Elliott, as the vice provost in charge of international affairs for universities. And uh, I think uh, we ought to try to get him uh, to take the lead and be in touch. Uh, you know, he works with our university president and other university presidents 
uh, and to try and make that case. I think that's a, a great thing for all of us to work. Another question comes in about uh, <clears throat> the impact of Chinese financial aid compared to US financial aid. Gives the example of Greece, uh, where the United States didn't come up much, with much, but now a Chinese company has a major stake in the port in Greece, uh, busiest port in the Mediterranean, fastest growing in the world. As China continues to build or improve the infrastructure of ports around the world, Southeast Asia, uh, Africa, Europe, uh, what will uh, be the impact? Uh, and will China use that then for political and possible military uh, purposes? Uh, complex question, not a short answer, and a great subject for a dissertation or thesis, <laughs> uh, <laughs> a long one, uh, but a, a few, I think a few elements in that. Yeah, I, I'm of course familiar with the Piraeus port in, uh, in Greece. And um, there are other cases. I mean, look, they built, I think they built one in Haifa. Uh, they built the, a couple of major infrastructure projects near where the US vessels port and uh, dock in Israel. Uh, so where we, one would think, have considerable leverage. Huh? Um, and with the Belt and Road uh, objectives, uh, there are going to be Chinese uh, ports and piers uh, built uh, all around the world. So here's the question. Um, you can't just, I, mean, I went through this with my friends who were still in the administration when the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank came along and uh, in about 2013, was it? And, and my friends in the administration were sort of snarling publicly about the Chinese uh, bank and sort of criticizing it. Um, and they were doing so on strategic terms. Can't let the Chinese get a march on it, get a march on us. And my answer to that was, that's not a winner. You know, that you can't beat something with nothing. And that's what we were doing. These countries need infrastructure, okay? Indonesia wants a metro system. Indonesia wants a new port. The Secretary of State can't show up in Jakarta and say, uh, don't take their evil $8 billion project uh, because they're horrible people. Uh, and when the Indonesians say back, we need a metro system, uh, we need a port, what are you offering us? Uh, the answer can't be, um, we'll put you in touch with some consultants in Washington and we'll do a study for you. Hmm? It, there has to be serious competition. And I think, I was thinking about this, I think it's a great question. I was thinking about this in connection with the Greece situation. <clears throat> you know, the, the Japanese have great capabilities, of course, in infrastructure uh, development. The South Koreans are very, very good. The Germans are very, very good. There's a, there's a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of experience, a lot of talent in the West, not to mention sort of residual American talent that hasn't been put to great use in recent years. Again, if we're serious with competing, about competing with China, uh, we shouldn't be wasting our time telling Jakarta that don't listen to them. We should be either figuring out how we can get our own companies uh, more capable of competing in these environments, uh, and or working with the Germans, the Japanese, and the South Koreans to figure out what the best combination uh, of talents, resources, uh, and skills is to offer the Jakarta's of the world an alternative. It, you know, to me, it's pretty straightforward. You're not going to win, quote, win. Yeah. So get back to the, the question. Yeah, I think in some cases there is uh, a partial. There sometimes is a Chinese strategic objective. You cannot assume that. There isn't always. Sometimes it's just commercial. Sometimes it's primarily commercial. Uh, uh, and sometimes the PLA is pretty happy 
with the fact that the Chinese are building it, but the but the port or the facility may well be an open facility. I think most of them are, if not all of them. Uh, other countries are going to be using them. Uh, I'm not sure if the Chinese can or will write terms with recipient countries saying under certain circumstances, we are going to, I don't know, exercise force majeure and shut down the port except for Chinese operations. I don't see that. So just because the Chinese build a port doesn't mean they got a base. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, on the other hand, one would be naive to think that they're not gaining uh, influence uh, and the, the PLA is not gaining some advantages from these activities. Here's a question about Taiwan as to whether uh, uh, Xi Jinping has just made a pledge we shouldn't leave the job of unifying Taiwan in future generations and that yet Taiwan society seems to be drifting away from the one country, two systems and China is very unhappy. What, what, is there a danger that China might uh, attack China? And if so, how should or would the United States respond? Um, by the way, you remind me, I, one part of the, the first question I didn't answer, Ezra, was something about uh, Biden-Xi Jinping relationship, I think you asked about. And, uh, yes, thank you, sir. Yeah, what I should have said was, uh, number one, they have a relationship because they traveled together for like 20 hours together in China and in the US when uh, they were both vice presidents. Uh, got to know each other pretty well. I had dinner with Biden after his travel around the country with Xi Jinping and talked about at some length about what he observed in Xi Jinping and what he admired uh, in uh, uh, about him. Um, on the other hand, in the debates, he referred to him twice as a thug. Huh? And of course, our political campaigns do not reward uh, calm analysis. Uh, and I suspect on the one hand, uh, Xi Jinping understood that, on the other hand, he didn't like it. So <laughs> we'll see if, uh, if, uh, if the thuggery uh, nomenclature is left in the rearview mirror where that goes, but... Um, well, we don't expect you to, give away, you to give away any secrets, but <laughs> are there some things you can say from what uh, Biden told you about the relationship that you might give any, are there any is there anything you could let us uh, get a flavor of uh, or what to expect in the relationship between the two? Uh, well, I think I, I say two things. <clears throat> One is that <clears throat> at the time, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I think Xi Jinping <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> conveyed the impression of a man who had governed, who had governed in Fujian, who had governed in, in Zhejiang, who had kind of on the ground experience in dealing with the problems of governing. Transportation, traffic, you know, sewage and water, <clears throat> education, uh, the things that our local officials have to deal with that sometimes are somewhat remote for people in Zhongnan High or the, or the White House. And Biden kind of likes people like that. He's kind of a, a practical guy. Uh, and I think he thought, here's someone who understands uh, these kinds of issues. Um, <clears throat> so I think that was, that was good. Uh, of course, that was back around 2012 or something like that. Uh, a lot's happened since then. And Xi Jinping has, and China have evolved uh, in some not altogether happy directions from the US perspective since then. So how much of that uh, appreciation of uh, a practical on the ground problem solver uh, survives as she has adopted more and more of the mantle uh, of, uh, uh, of Mao, successor to Mao and ideological leader, I don't know. Um, Taiwan, um, I think still 
that the main objective of Xi Jinping and the Chinese leadership is not to seek reunification in the short term. I still think that their uh, objective is to prevent uh, independence, which they can define in various ways, uh, but they consider the current situation not independence. Uh, so uh, they will be, I think, uh, will accept the situation so long as Taiwan does not move from its status quo into a more formal independence uh, posture. That the, I'm not saying that they can accept that forever. I'm saying that I think that they that is their goal at the moment, and that's what they will accept for some time. I uh, uh, Tsai Ing-wen is certainly not uh, Chen Shui Bian. She is not a uh, a rash uh, actor who, who is going to undertake referendums or plebiscites or changes in the constitution to move in that direction. Uh, the Chinese, uh, I'm not, the Chinese know that they should quietly appreciate that more than they do. Uh, they certainly convey every time you talk to them in the sense that they regard Tsai as a, uh, a hopeless Taiwan independence advocate who has shattered the one China uh, principle. Uh, but surely they must understand that she is um, uh, not dark green to use the Taiwan vocabulary. Uh, and they, they should understand that they could do a lot worse. Um, that isn't to say that one can be calm. The you know, lately, uh, the PRC has kind of stepped up uh, pressure, stepped up military signaling, uh, both through uh, fighter jets crossing over the midline between Taiwan and the PRC, with Global Times threatening to have Chinese fighter jets overfly Taiwan, and daring Taiwan to shoot them down. Uh, uh, to which they will respond fiercely. Uh, there's a lot of uh, sort of nasty rhetoric uh, in the air. I think that some of the U.S. approach on Taiwan of late has, uh, and the general collapse of the U.S. PRC relationship has persuaded Beijing that they can be more rash vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Taiwan than before. Again, as my point in my presentation, if they don't feel that the US-China relationship holds benefits for them, uh, then it doesn't serve as a restraint in many ways, including this way. So I would hope that the Biden team which knows the Taiwan issue very well. They've been involved in it, all of them have been involved in it forever. I would hope that they will reiterate persuasively the basic elements of it, of the one China policy, of the Taiwan Relations Act uh, to both Taipei and Beijing in a way that serves to freeze the situation. Now, there's no question developments in Hong Kong have uh, been profoundly unhelpful. Uh, not that anyone in Taiwan viewed Hong Kong as a possible model for, uh, for Taiwan, that everyone in Taiwan explicitly rejected the one country, two system model in Hong Kong, which they now regard as a demonstrable uh, failure. But, but as long as Beijing believed that the one country, two systems model uh, had some utility uh, towards Hong Kong and the future towards Taiwan, it, it served as encouraging uh, moderation in Beijing. 
if Beijing has now concluded after the protests in Hong Kong last year that one country, two systems is hopeless, that to put it crudely, uh, no matter how benevolent our one country, two systems is, they're, they're gonna hate us uh, in Taiwan or Hong Kong. They're just gonna run amok. They will not accept our version of one country, two systems, uh, which seems to be the conclusion that Beijing drew from 2019 uh, and led to the new national security law. Um, then that discourages Beijing's belief that peaceful reunification really is a serious option. Uh, so we've got, uh, we all know we've got a long-term problem in PRC Taiwan relations. The approach has always been to kick the can down the road. Uh, I think it still has to be to kick the can down the road. And there are different things to do involving both deterrence and reassurance in kicking the can down the road. You can't do just one or the other. Uh, I have nothing new to say on the subject of what would we do if the balloon ever went up in the Taiwan Strait? Uh, to me, uh, as a former US official, it would be irresponsible for me to talk about that. Uh, and beyond that, um, when that unhappy day comes, if it ever comes, uh, the President of the United States is gonna have to make a, uh, a political decision uh, of a, which is way beyond the pay grade of, um, of me and anyone else. Here is a question from Nason Mabui. Uh, it has to do with TPP, now uh, CPTPP. Uh, is it possible that uh, the new administration, Biden, might be willing to try to enter the CPTPP? And what do you think the, uh, here's a related issue, uh, the problem with the Biden administration, if Biden with a GOP uh, Congress, uh, then, you know, what happens to trade issues if we have that kind of situation? So I guess that's two uh, questions. Yeah, that's a real wow question. I, I think that, you know, there's what would make sense in an economics textbook and then what's possible in Washington. And I don't think the two overlap in any way. Uh, I think the idea that uh, Biden could bring the US into TPP or whatever it's called now just is not on uh, the combination of uh, the support that organized labor uh, has provided uh, to Biden in his campaign and he looks for going forward. Uh, Biden's general, uh, I would say, you know, build in America uh, instincts uh, these don't uh, impel him towards uh, pushing uh, aggressively against his own party and Republicans to get into TPP. Uh, the politics of it, I think, are impossible. Um, on the other hand, there is reality. Uh, the reality being, uh, number one, all of the TPP countries have reduced barriers to each other. Uh, and they are in particular the Japanese and the Australians and Canadians and will have advantages uh, in all of these markets uh, against US competitors because we are not taking advantage of those uh, provisions of TPP. Uh, and at some point, the Biden administration will start hearing from them. They'll start hearing from, from farmers and ranchers and manufacturers who are saying, gosh, you know, the uh, access to these markets, we're at a disadvantage. And he's gonna have to figure out what to do about that. Then you have the second problem, or maybe the first problem, which is he's inheriting, I don't know, $350 billion in, in Chinese products that are subject to high tariffs uh, in the United States and another, I don't know, I forget the number uh, on US tariffs 
uh, on Chinese tariffs going into uh, into China from the U.S. And what's he going to do about those? Um, I think that a Biden team would not have done what the Trump administration did from day one in getting us to this point uh, on tariffs. On the other hand, uh, and uh, there are a lot of good studies that show how damaging it has been to the US economy uh, in general and to specific sectors. On the other hand, unwinding them uh, is I think going to be politically brutally difficult. Uh, he won't be able to unwind them uh, without corresponding concessions uh, or adjustments on the Chinese side that go beyond tariff reductions. I think they'll go to structural issues uh, in the United, in China. Uh, I mean, serious economists tend to believe that tariffs is not the answer. The, the, pro the problems in our trade with China have to do with with state-owned enterprises and with subsidies and with IPR theft and forced tech transfer and with a regulatory environment that is uh, wanting and highly discriminatory and absence of national treatment, a whole range of structural issues uh, that need to be taken on um, and where we've been wrestling with the Chinese for decades I mean, my own view, and I told this to the Chinese over and over, is that I believe they need to make a, a clear, unequivocal public commitment to accepting the full obligations of a developed country within the World Trade Organization across the board in every one of these areas and in other areas in a persuasive and convincing way. When China got into the WTO, it was kind of as a hybrid. Hmm? It was, a, from my perspective, a very good deal. I negotiated it uh, under Bob Zelik, but it was not a full developed country deal. And that was 2001. So it's a very different China now. Uh, I get tired of Chinese economists telling me that they are still a developing country. Uh, and that they need these protections. Uh, I think we should be uh, insistent on this and do this in conjunction with our EU and Japanese, Canadian, Australian partners. This is an area where I think you can get multilateral pressure uh, and try to coordinate your policies and your market behavior to get the Chinese to alter these practices rather than doing some sort of managed trade uh, deals to get you know, agricultural imports increased from 20 billion to 28 billion on a bilateral basis. But I, and the bottom line is, I, 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 implicit in the question, I think it's, it's the right question in that it's hard to have a China trade policy or a TPP trade policy until you know what your overall trade policy is. And I'm not 100% sure what the balance of forces will be within a Biden administration uh, on, uh, on trade issues. I don't think it'll be uh, like following in the footsteps of Bob Lighthizer. Uh, on the other hand, it's not gonna be a, uh, uh, an aggressive free trade uh, approach. It's gonna be somewhere, somewhere gray. There's a, another anonymous question. Uh, it has to do with the multilateralism. And uh, as we all know that under the Trump administration, uh, China is uh, tending to become a leader in international organizations or stepping up uh, while the United States is playing a lesser role. Uh, if Biden is elected, do you envisage any changes in US policy and uh, what are the opportunities for taking a larger role in some international organizations and how will that work out in terms of relations with China? Uh, yeah, for sure. I, I think it's been one of the most disgraceful aspects of, uh, of this administration. I mean, just to be practical, uh, there is no question that a Biden administration would rejoin the World Health Organization. 
um, which isn't to endorse the World Health Organization's behavior uh, during COVID-19, which I think was somewhere between mediocre and disgraceful uh, in, uh, in many instances. Uh, uh, but you know, you don't fix it by marching away from the world's uh, premier health organization in the middle of the greatest pandemic uh, in modern times. It's crazy, and Biden will correct that immediately. Uh, similarly, I believe that the Trump administration has been on a trajectory towards, uh, if not withdrawal, then destruction destruction of or sidelining of the World Trade Organization, uh, I think that will be reversed as well. But having said that, I, I think we need to understand that these and other international institutions, multi institutions are badly in need of reform. Now, simply rejoining them is doing no one a favor, including, including us. Uh, I mean, I was involved with WTO and China's succession. I remember going to a meeting when it had, I think, 158 members. Now it's up to like 190 members. It operates by consensus. Huh? Uh, consensus means everyone. Okay, I remember when I was there for the Doha round, we had to wait for, you know, to browbeat Zimbabwe into dropping its objections to the Doha Declaration, Zimbabwe, you know. With all due respect, who cares about Zimbabwe's views? Uh, India was more of a problem, but they were a problem too, okay? The, you can't have an organization like that that operates on a basic consensus with 190 members. It doesn't work. Uh, we need some kind of reforms in these organizations uh, towards, I guess, what I'd call more of a plurilateral model where the key actors uh, form kind of subgroups that can effectively drive the agenda. Uh, sort of like the UN Security Council uh, in its best times vis-a-vis -vis the UN General Assembly, which kind of does nothing, huh? Um, so yeah, I, I think that the Biden team will be very enthusiastic about rejoining these organizations and reestablishing our presence in multi institutions. The Trump administration about a year or so ago, I remember they, they appointed a, a special envoy or something or an ambassador, I don't know what his title was, to keep track of or combat Chinese uh, advances in, in getting leadership positions in international organizations. I remember it was a very curious position. I'd never seen anything like that in my uh, <clears throat> professional career in 30 years in foreign service that we have a a special ambassador to kind of, I don't know, like being a linebacker watching a running quarterback, you know, is kind of, on the one hand, didn't make much sense. On the other hand, the Chinese really have been on the march in nominating people and gaining director general and leadership positions in many of these organizations. But again, it comes back to the question I was raising in my initial remarks. Do you win a competition by trying to trip the other guy or you try to outrun him? Uh, and clearly the Trump administration view was we're gonna trip him, you know? We're gonna just, each time we see one of these Chinese uh, officials pop up as a potential head of the international, you know, civil aeronautical organization or whatever, we're gonna go out and lobby and make sure he doesn't get the job, okay? That's fine, I get that. In many cases, uh, the Chinese leadership of some of these organizations would be destructive of our goals. Like there was one case involving, I think, uh, it was the IPR. That would have been a farce. In other cases, not so much. But you win by having good candidates of your own and allied good candidates, not by creating a special department of, uh, we're going to hunt down Chinese uh, competitors who uh, in international organizations everywhere. I think I speak for everyone when I say how impressed we are with the broad ranging uh, professionalism that you bring to this work. And now at the White House, uh, we have Matt Fossinger who's a journalist, but we have nobody as I know who's a foreign service specialist from China who brings a range of experience. Uh, and 
we academics can see that the uh, administration, the Trump administration has not made good use of professionals and that we're really in very bad shape for professionals. How can, uh, will there be China professionals now who are ready and able to take a high White House position advising a Biden administration? And what do we do to build up professionalism and try to make some uh, progress in getting a, a broad group of uh, well-trained, highly experienced professionals who worked on China in the high positions in the State Department and at the White House? Um, there are a few elements to that, uh, to that challenge, Ezra. I think one is that this is an administration that clearly does not value uh, uh, expertise. I'm not talking specifically about China, but as a general matter. And frankly, they're rather proud of it. Uh, they, uh, this comes from the president. Um, this is a man who believes in his own judgment, uh, in his own gut. Uh, and uh, does not welcome um, briefings, uh, reading materials, um, uh, and makes policies by tweet. Uh, and so there's not much premium uh, on expertise at the top of this administration and that trickles down. Um, so that I think will automatically change. But I think that the expertise level in, uh, in many agencies, and not just in the China field, has been badly damaged over the last few years as there has been disdain for professionals, for experts uh, who uh, have a president uh, routinely referring to them as the deep state. Uh, and I believe he means it, and I believe he believes it, and I believe that many people in the US in this administration view it that way. Uh, there's going to have to be a, I think a kind of a across the board renaissance program from the top uh, on how you save the CIA, the State Department, the Department of Justice, the FBI, uh, some of these agencies that have come under uh, explicit attack or been undermined uh, in the last few years, okay? So that's one challenge. China more specifically, I think there's a couple of pieces to it where there's differing responsibilities. I think it's going to be difficult in Washington, somewhat difficult because I think, I think that China is going to become a more polarizing issue in the next few years. Um, even though there's more of a bipartisan consensus towards, I guess, what you might call generally a more skeptical view of China or a more competitive view of China. Okay, let's take that as a framework. That said, as I look at the way the politics is shaping up, um, let's say hypothetically that Trump is out or even if he's not out, the likely successors and contenders on the Republican side. Uh, ones who come to mind are Mike Pompeo, Mike Pence, Tom Cotton, Josh Hawley, Nikki Haley, Marco Rubio. They have all made speaches, in some cases several speeches, taking very, very hard positions uh, on China, very ideological positions on China. Uh, uh, which I read as, um, I will assume that reflects their convictions, that it's not insincere, uh, but I also see it as positioning themselves uh, within the Republican Party uh, with the hardest position uh, on China. They are vying for that role because at least at this moment, they think it's politically advantageous, particularly in the wake of COVID, uh, the Chinese flu, as the president calls it. Okay. So I have concerns that whenever Biden does what he does on China, um, uh, unless he decides to be Mike Pompeo redux, which I do not believe he will be, even if it's a what you might call a firm, somewhat skeptical policy, 
it will be hit very, very hard from the right. Uh, I regard that as a certainty, okay? Uh, and if that's the case, I, I don't want to say we're back to the 1950s, uh, but there's something of that, there'll be something of that dynamic where China expertise, uh, there is the risk that China expertise will be seen uh, the way that the China experts of the 1950s were seen uh, as apologists for China or associated with a policy of a strategy of engagement toward China uh, or apologizing for China because they've lived there or whatever. Uh, I'm concerned about that, okay? And finally, I think that the academy writ large has a role, a major role here in which I'm not an expert, but I speak based on what some of my academic friends say to me, which is that um, uh, the uh, academy could do a better job at training people with broad gauged understanding uh, of China, uh, that there has been uh, a strong emphasis on uh, narrower specialties, on quantitative um, uh, criteria, uh, and that area expertise, historical knowledge, uh, and the, let's say, the softer tools that I grew up with, um, and that those of us who have been in public service have relied upon um, that those are going to need some countervailing attention as well as the as the hard skills that are being taught in the academy. Jeff, I think we're so fortunate that you're willing to take as much time as you did to be with us today in such a broad ranging uh, perspective. And uh, it's the kind of wisdom we hope uh, uh, Biden can make use of uh, you indirectly or people like you, your successors, uh, to bring some wisdom and good sense. So we're very much in your debt and uh, we uh, look forward to keeping in touch. Thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you, Ezra. Thanks for, to all the old friends on the call and new friends. Bye-bye.